Tara Nyquist is an American political analyst and independent researcher who's published thousands of articles over the past three decades in media outlets such as Financial Sense, WND, and the Epoch Times, and is the author of The Origins of the Fourth World War. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Mr. Nyquist's work, and uh, which is saying something as someone who has a uh, doll of himself, an, a narcissist, for me to be in awe of Mr. Nyquist and uh, someone so narcissistic, he has a statue of himself, but the statue of myself, as you can see, is uh, kind of decked out for Halloween in his J.R. Nyquist Halloween outfit. Um, and <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to start our, our, our theme today is going to be the concept of conspiracy theories. And Mr. Nyquist and I are going to be essentially uh, counsel for the prosecution and counsel for the defense. He will be the voice of reason. And I will be the guy who believes in Bigfoot and the Loch Ness monster and uh, all other such, you know, spurious, you know, kind of <laughs> conspiracies, but go ahead. Uh, JR, like tell, tell, tell me like your, your, your take on, on the, the notion of conspiracies. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that there's a difference between conspiracy history and conspiracy theory, the problem is with the word theory. And mm -hmm. the problem is, is that what you see, people crave fiction. I I was told I was given a dressing down on talk radio this week by a caller who, who called me NyQuil and said, uh, basically, uh, you are you are boring. Mm -hmm. And of course, reality is prosaic and it's not as exciting as the fictions that we can make up the stories we can make up about reality mm -hmm. because those stories that we can make up about reality are in fact quite boring um that's that's the reality um so uh, you know it was gustav leban who wrote the crowd who said that the 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 basically people prefer fiction to reality they don't like reality most people don't like it so and he said that ideas are like you know a bad cold you catch these ideas and of course these ideas aren't true because the ideas mm -hmm. that uh, appeal to you the fiction that you crave for are what you pick up like a bad flu or something and so people every generation has caught something some kind of disease of, mm -hmm. of the mind, of perception, a perceptual disease. And to understand every era properly is to understand the disease lens through which every era sees reality. Mm -hmm. And one of the disease lenses is conspiracy theory, which the intelligence services of the world have played up because to have people who believe, you know, ideology, conspiracy theory, uh, crazy notions about reality make people more malleable, more manipulable. Mm -hmm. Because if you believe something this crazy, I can feed you a narrative that flatters that misperception mm -hmm. and I can then manipulate you and get you to move to where I want you to move. Whereas if you're attempt if you've got a humility and you're trying to see reality, which is much more complex, you mm -hmm. might find out that I'm your enemy mm -hmm. and that what you thought was true is kind of an illusion. That your 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 you know our ability to see reality is not very good, and in fact sometimes some things have to be believed to be seen. Of course, and this gets us to quantum mechanics, quantum physics, right? It gets us to Parmenides. Real, what is reality, and to what extent do we make it, make reality or make it seeming? And what is the dividing line between mm -hmm. fiction and that inner reality? You mentioned quantum uh, mechanics. I just want to jump in there really quickly because there was um, Herbert Hoover created something called the Foundation for the Study of Cycles. And uh, I never heard of it uh, until very recently. And it's very interesting because um, there was two two academics and their names were uh, Dewey and Dakin. And they wrote a book called Cycles, the the, the Science of Prediction. And uh, so they, they basically noticed that even though like in quantum mechanics, right, you, you can never know exactly where an electron is. However, you can determine the aggregate. If you're looking at, at kind of at the aggregate, it helps you do probabilities better. 
And so they were talking about it's impossible to to predict a single person's life. But when you look kind of at the meta picture, you can see certain patterns, certain cycles, you know. And so so he was kind of equating this, you know, kind of pattern recognition with quantum mechanics in, the, in that sense that we can't do it in the individual level. But on the aggregate, you do see certain discernible cycles and patterns and um I just wanted to hit something too that you said. You you mentioned Mark Twain, and Mark Twain famously said, uh, "Never let the truth get in the way of a good story." And uh, th- this came up. I was reading a book on disinformation, and the the gentleman, you know, kind of asked, like, "How do we perceive truth? How does the human mind perceive truth?" And the answer to that is narrative, right? So whoever gives you a narrative, whether he, whether it's true or not, you, the the mind loves narrative. They it loves like a simple, easy to digest kind of you know idea, storyline, a story arc. And if you can present that to them, they'll latch onto that. And that's basically the I've noticed that with with fake news lately. What what we call yeah. fake news, disinformation, whatever you want to call that, is that it's based it's based on the conspiracy template. I mean, look yes. at look at the news. Yeah, but go ahead, oh, yeah. jump jump in on that. Both the left and the right, by the way, more and more, it used to be that all these conspiracy narratives you'd found on the find on the left, more or less, uh, in, like in the 1950s and 60s, it was more on the left. Now the right is is totally uh, subsumed by it. The Nazis and their milieu, the far right and the far left in, in, in Weimar Germany were both obsessed. We're now like Weimar now, very much so. We're, mm. We've moved into this uh, grounding. And uh, of course, since people crave fiction, and this is what they are now being Mm -hmm. spoon-fed, once you get people, see, um, I, you know, let's talk about Parmenides for a second. Mm -hmm. Parmenides said something. Parmenides said something interesting in in one of his fragments. It's the divine beyond is the eternal now, right? And if this is this is to be understood as one continuous. Uh, coherent whole. And in other words, our concept of time is kind of a self-deception. And so when you were talking about cycles, you see people have these expectations about the future. And I run into this all the time. You have the the people who believe the Hal Lindsey kind of biblical prophecy future, right? Mm-hmm. You've, they've got this belief, and I've heard it since I was a little boy about, you know, Jesus is coming any day now in the parable of the olive tree and Israel, the, the, the return of the Jews to Israel is the sign of the end times and so on and so forth. They have this expectation like they had in the time of Paul, the apostle, which, of course, Christ did not return at that time. But they they believed that they've been told this, that Christ is coming back, but he didn't. And the thing is, is that we have these. And, and it's the same thing with cycle theory. Look, uh, David Hume was famous for saying, okay, the sun rises every morning. You know, the earth is spinning and it's orbiting the sun. And we have this expectation that the earth, but just because every morning for the last, you know, millions of years, the sun has risen or, you know, the earth has continued to turn, doesn't mean tomorrow won't be different, right? Because mm-hmm. something cosmic could happen to change it. And so the same thing with cycle theory. I remember, you know, where I worked for Financial Sense, they were looking at these cycles and and they really take them serious in economic analysis. And they're really very good. They they have some very interesting models. But what's fascinating is, is that it doesn't really work exactly. And mm-hmm. suddenly there are things, okay, they find out the exception later, but it's like, wait a minute, this is not really a science. You know, is you quoted Mark Twain. I think it was Mark Twain, or it was, uh, um, it was another American smart aleck that said, "Never make predictions, especially about the future." <laughs> right? If we could really, if the if prediction was really a science, right? Although mm-hmm. people have made successful predictions, right? There have been some amazing predictions, both in the in the paranormal sense of people who. <laughs> Who, who shouldn't have known, had any way of knowing certain things were going to happen, to scientists or intelligence analysts or strategists who are saying, the enemy's going to do this. This is what they're planning. This is how it's going to work out. So there are there's good analysis. It's rare. And there's also fake psychics, fake prophets, mm-hmm. and there's the rare real one. Well, there's... So there, Go yeah. ahead, finish. Go ahead. Yeah. So so this is the problem is, is that you have all these people who have their favorite mm-hmm. seer or their favorite analyst. 
And they all have these expectations. But you see, why do they actually favor one over another? Mm -hmm. It's because they crave a certain kind of story that leads them again and again to false expectations about the future. And this is why people are fooled again and again. Look at the uh, the intelligence failure in Israel over the Hamas attack. Somebody had a false expectation mm -hmm. in Israeli intelligence, just like in the Yom Kippur War, just like before Pearl Harbor. What, what, what did Admiral Kimmel and General Short really expect since they'd been given a war warning and they were told to expect that war with Japan was going to break out? Mm -hmm. Didn't they even think the Japanese carrier fleet had gone silent? They didn't know where it was. Did they ever occur to them, hey, it might be heading this way. Maybe we should send some submarines out looking for it. Because he had submarines sitting there. He could have sent mm -hmm. them out scouting to see if the Japanese carrier fleet. Didn't he think of this? You know, when people want to exoner exonerate Kimmel and Short, I'm sorry, I know enough about military operations that I don't give them exoneration at all. Those submarines should have gone out scouting for the Japanese fleet because it was possible that the carriers would head for Pearl Harbor. Once they lost, last sighted, I think, at, at near Hokkaido, Japan, uh, in terms of where they picked up their radio signals. So, so we see people fool themselves. It's like, oh no, they couldn't go that far. It's too far, they would be spotted. There's mm -hmm. horrible storms in the North Pacific. They'd never do that. Um, oh yeah? Well, it's just like saying, well, Hannibal would never cross the Alps. Yeah, it's insane. You know, he'd come from the south. Uh, it's insane. It uh, you know, <laughs> Napoleon would wouldn't force march his army from the English Channel into Austria and capture us. You know, by surprise. You know, we're talking about the old capitulation in mm -hmm. what was it, eighteen oh five. So, so it's it's the 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 thing is is that um, we. Uh, we always have these false expectations which catch us out. And it's in our politics. It's in our ide See, ideology is a poison. And ideology, we get all these expectations from our ideology. And mm -hmm. ideology is nonsense. And conspiracy theory is really just a narrative form of ideology, which boils down to this. They, them are doing it to us. <laughs> Did that. <laughs> the evil rich people, the evil aristocrats, the evil Catholic Church, or the uh -huh. evil, you know, Christians, or the evil whatever, you know, the evil communists, um, uh, the evil Nazis. And the thing is, is yeah, everybody. There's good and bad, and there that there are some evil people, and there there are real conspiracies, or what I would call more likely in the open movements, like the communist movement, the Nazi revolution mm -hmm. is was real. Um, they did all these bad things. And it's amazing how people fooled themselves. Oh, Hitler is a guy we can do business with. You know, Brezhnev is a guy we can do business with. Our uncle Joe Stalin. Uh, Putin is a reasonable Mussolini. fellow. Yeah, it makes right? the trains run on time. Yeah. And look at Xi Jinping. Oh, he's wonderful. Look at how cheap we can make things. With business. Yeah, exactly. It's, that's yeah. an interesting uh, well, let's correlation. Let's invest in him. Mussolini he's wonderful. Yeah, exactly. And of course, because all of these, I remember I was told by a, advisor to a billionaire, a famous, mm. famous conservative billionaire. He said, we're not going to finance you, Mr. Nyquist, and we, we want you to stop promoting your book, Origins of the Fourth World War, because nobody in the industrial or the financial elite in America is going to accept that because they want to invest in China and they want to invest in, in, in the former Soviet Union countries. And your exposition would, would is against that. And that's exactly what they want to do. And so the only way we can make them the world safe and allow them to invest is we just we we get everybody to build ballistic missile defense for America so that the Russian and Chinese missiles can't reach us. And I almost couldn't believe my ears that this man was that naive mm -hmm. that we would actually build a workable, you know, missile defense, that we would even have a working nuclear deterrent in 20 years. Which it turns out we may not have a working nuke because we haven't built a nuclear weapon in in since 1992. We haven't tested one since 1992. Yeah, and they're way past their shelf life, right? Well, so, you're talking about war. War. I wanted to just jump in really quickly. You yeah. mentioned war. We're talking about conspiracies as the theme. 
And you said, you know, like shocking things that will happen in war that you didn't expect. Uh, sometimes yes, by always. accident, sometimes by design, right? right. Like uh, misinformation, the Chinese, just getting back to the Chinese, mm -hmm. um, like uh, Graham Allison has a great book called Destined for War. Uh, he's the China expert at Harvard. And uh, he talks about, you know, the, the the famous kind of deceptions that the Chinese would do, the first propagandists. And you mentioned to me once uh, that, the, that the earliest recorded incident of like a false, you know, kind of defector was from China. What what was that? What was 1900 that? BC, an ancient yeah. Chinese text mentions false defector. And, mm -hmm. and stories of false defectors in China are just legendary. Mm -hmm. They just celebrate these people. A guy, uh, a sage, they call them not strategists, but sages. Mm -hmm. And so a sage will defect from one king seeming to be unhappy and he'll go over to another king and I have so many good things to tell you. And of course, it's all an elaborate trap. Yeah. Right. The false defector. So they have these stories about these sages. Um, and of course, uh, when you're talking about um, Xi Jinping and the Chinese and how they've drawn us, sucked us in and how we just, you know, people say, oh, the capitalists are all doing it on purpose. See, mm -hmm. they're so brilliant. They make everything. But uh, people forget everybody, every human being is limited. And they're limited mm. to their, in a way, to their function. The plumber, he knows plumbing. But what does he know about electricity? Unless he's trained as an electrician, he doesn't know electrician stuff. He knows his specialty. Everybody tends to specialize in his. Teddy Roosevelt once said, uh, you know, I, 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 I can hardly stand these, these business people because they're monomaniacs about their business. And they mm. don't know very much outside of their business. They're geniuses to compete and to achieve at this level in business. Mm -hmm. they, they're they all in on that business. And it's about making money. It's about making a better, better mousetrap. But when it comes to understanding politics, mm -hmm. they're awful. Well, it's not they their job. They don't know. Right. And it's you, supposed you to be the book. politicians who are at the higher level. And we don't have that class. We were supposed to have like wiser, more ethical men kind of reigning in the business class. Like uh, Adam Smith, there's a quote I wanted to share it with you. Adam Smith says, we rarely hear it has been said of the combinations of masters. They're frequently those of workmen. But whoever imagines upon this account that masters rarely combine is as ignorant of the world as of the subject. And he says that in The Wealth of Nations. So basically he's saying, yes, rich people do conspire. However, you're right. They conspire at a different level. They might conspire to gain a market. They might conspire to right. you know corner the silver market. Or or in the 19th century, it was uh, canals and bonds. You and, know, yeah. And they but do that higher stuff level thinking. Too. They don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they do stupid stuff. And the thing is, because see, if you if you have a hierarchy of understanding, politics is up here. You know, you mm -hmm. you've got spiritual things and religion and the in the soul up here, but you got politics here. Economics is down here. So that, your economic understandings yeah. don't, you know, people think economic, you know, there's an economism mm -hmm. and people say, well, you know, economics rules. Oh, does it? Well, Chairman Mao had this figured out. He said, political power comes from a gun, right? Mm -hmm. So you got John D. Rockefeller. No, no, no. It comes from a bank account. So Mao has the yin and way. And Mao says, okay, you get all the money. I'll put money in your pocket and you give me the political power because you have all the money, okay? And then later stick them up. Now I have all the guns and all the money. Yeah, right? exactly. Because political power comes with military power, with police power. And that's how Mao took over China. Um, he worked with the landlords. He worked with the um, the uh, the heroin uh, uh, traffickers. And he took over China because he put money in pieces. Why sew up their pockets? Help them get rich. We'll make them rich on Friday. And on Monday, we'll, we'll line them up against the wall and shoot them all. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, you have all the money. I'll have all the guns. We'll split it that way. All right, stick them up. Now I have all the money and all the guns. So, so people don't understand that politics on that level, on this basic level of analysis mm -hmm. is higher than uh, economics. And people forget, you know, in, in the chicken and egg problem, people think, well, the country with the most money is the country with the biggest military. But they don't think about what comes first in this chicken or egg problem. Does Do, do the men with arms, with weapons come before the men with money? Actually, they do. You look at the fall of the Roman Empire in the Dark Ages. Who emerges out? Not money people. Guys on horseback with swords and armor, 
riding, you know, heavy cavalry, riding down their enemy, protecting the neighborhood. And by protecting the neighborhood, they then created the, the environment in which towns could form and the urban bourgeoisie could start to build, mm -hmm. to rebuild from the destruction, the total destruction of, of, the, of the economies. I mean, when the Roman Empire fell, the city of Rome went from a city of, you know, 900,000 people to a city of 30,000 people in the lifetime of one person where sheep were grazing in the forum. Mm -hmm. So you had the de-urbanization. It was almost like somebody set off hydrogen bombs in all the cities of the Western Roman Empire. And it, of course, it was just barbarian invasions. People don't understand how delicate the economic system is once you throw the monkey wrench of the guys with weapons in there. In this case, the Germanic barbarians that mm -hmm. came flooding in the vandals. You know, we get the word vandalism coming in through Gaul and S Spain and then invading North Africa, just wiping out and yeah. plundering everything in their path. Um, Andalusia in Spain was Vandalusia. It was named after the vandals who went yeah. to southern Spain and then into North Africa taking over. Yeah. Time. And you've and they left their DNA behind as they went. Um, mm -hmm. So so you see, it's it's. Um, so, so what we have, we have misunderstood history. And I'll, I'll give one more analysis from this. If you go to ancient history, mm -hmm. you would say, did the commercially, did the commercial powers, the ones with all the cash, did they win the wars in the ancient world? So let's go to the war between poor Greece and Persia. Persia was enormously rich. They controlled the Nile. They, they controlled mm -hmm. Egypt. The, 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 the Persian king was the king of kings had these enormous hordes. He tried to, the Persian kings tried to invade Greece twice and they failed dramatically twice. The little Athenians in one instance and the little Spartans, the 300, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, stopped the Persian invasion, basically, essentially. Um, and then the Greeks invaded in under Alexander the Great, the Macedonians who were like the, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the 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 uh, the country Hicks of the Greek world went and overwhelmed the Persian Empire with Alexander's tiny little army, defeated the Persian one Persian horde after another, and and all these battles and made the Greek the 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 Greek East. And so that was one example. But but think again the Peloponnesian War that was the the mercantile empire of Athens against Sparta that used bronze as money. They didn't even use gold and silver yeah, they coins. Were very the Spartans were, too. they were Spartan, right? Yeah. And who won the Peloponnesian War? You know, decades of this contest between, you know, the, these poor these these poor folks in in the heart of Greece, and, and you know the Peloponnesians and the Athenians with their island empire and their vast commerce and their huge fleet. The Athenians lost. They lost the war. Yeah, they were the, they were comparable to the Democrats today. They were the liberals. Well, the, uh, the, the, they and, were and democracy. Yeah, well, the they Spartans had the were comparable to the conservatives of the of, the, uh, <laughs> of that of that fatal variety, that yeah. dream of democracy. And then you have the Romans and the Carthaginians. Well, look at how rich the Carthaginians were. Mm -hmm. They were the master traders of their you know of the of the third century BC. And yet the Romans, who were just farmers with their Italian farmer allies. They had they when they first went to war with the Carthaginians, they didn't have a navy. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any triremes. They they couldn't build a quinquireme, right? But they uh, uh, a a, um, a Carthaginian vessel wrecked on their coast in a storm, and they copied it and they started building their own. And they defeated by sheer by 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 just the the integrity and the honesty. And the Republican virtue of the the ancient Romans, the ancient Roman Republic, they defeated Carthage with all their money bags. Yeah, right. So we think you know people have made this the thing that we're Carthage, and you know that it's Alexander Dugan, the Russian uh, propagandist, calls himself a philosopher. You know he he is Carthage must be destroyed. He means. America must be destroyed because mm -hmm. America's Carthage Cato, because yeah. he sees Russia as Rome, the third mm -hmm. Rome, right? And the West is Carthage. America's Carthage. And that analogy is what they're going by now. It doesn't matter they're poor. They don't have the same technology. Mm -hmm. 
and and so you see it is it simply is not the case that we always believe the rich country is going to always win because with the british empire the british empire was very successful but the british empire and of course the american empire in a way the american republic mm-hmm. have kind of our, our the history under those two formations has read differently than it read heretofore we were able to make we had sort of a combination we had this power but we also had this republican virtue and we had a mixed system that polybius said was the key to the success of the roman republic the british had mixed monarchy which was modeled on that old roman virtue yeah. and we had our republic which was modeled on the mixed you know checks and balances system and it is it and so we had the best of both worlds we had a bit of Roman, we had a bit of Athens. Uh, we had a bit of Roman, we had a bit of Carthage. But now that we've reached this degenerative stage in our, uh, it, it, you could call it plutocracy, where our aristocracy, where our system of checks and balances is breaking down. Now we're in this stage where suddenly we are Carthage. And we do have this problem mm-hmm. because if we lose our money, we no longer have that Republican the virtue. other virtues. Yeah. To protect. Yes. I wanted to make something a point really quickly. Um, you mentioned kind of like how everybody thinks like materialists, right? We're in our materialist age. And so we think, oh, money, money, money. It's the economy, stupid. You know, they'll, they'll t- money, everything comes back to money, running the country as a business rather than as our home. Um, James Carville, I think that the economy stupid made that yeah. phrase. But if you look at uh, in the in the Republic, Plato talks about you know the the taxonomy of a society, and he breaks it down into three parts. And at the top is the gold class, then the silver class, then you know kind of the the bronze class, right. iron class, and the top is comparable to truth based people, which are the thinkers, the philosophers. In the center, that is honor based people, the silver class, and these are the soldiers, the police, people who crave honor. And at the bottom are the people. He, he correlates it to the appetitive part of the soul, which is the the, the craftsmen, the tradesmen, the farmers, the people the who very feed bottom? you your physical needs. And so, so basically, you know, so so you so. You, the, the economists are the lowest level of anybody, you know, like anybody who who predicates that. And so now we're running our society along the lines of the lowest common denominator That's rather right. than any spiritual aspirations or rather we, than any truth aspirations. We've inverted. Look, um, it was Julius Evola. I'm not going to steal his idea, but one of his mm-hmm. most ingenious analysis, which is which I find to be true and quite profound, is one of the things we've we modernity has done is there's an inversion of everything. You know, man and woman is inverted, class is inverted. Well, mm. you you mentioned this hierarchy that that Plato is kind of Plato is saying we can't make an ideal society, but this is how if we look at the ancient kingdoms, it was the priest kings. It was that golden, you know, they're they're they reflect, they speak for the people to God, they pray to God for the people, and they represent God to the people, you know, the priest kings. Mm. Um, of Samaria, of Babylon, of you got Moses in the Old Testament, you've got the Egyptian pharaohs, they all played this role. Mm-hmm. And then below them, the silver class, the the honorable warriors, and so on. Well, if you look at the ages since antiquity, you you then you suddenly had an age after the fall of Rome where the the and and as the church was losing its grip, where the silver you had chivalry and everything was ruled by the aristocracy. Mm-hmm. You have this aristocratic age. Yeah, honor. And that gives way, the aristocracy gives way to the bourgeoisie, right? Mm -hmm. And this almost, you can see, it's almost stolen by by Marx. And then Marx says it's the proletariat that takes over. So then what what are you doing? You are now eliminating the higher classes. And you're Mm -hmm. reducing everything. You're leveling everything down to the lowest class. And you're making them the ruling class. It's bad enough that the merchant class, the businessman, is now the ruler. Yeah, and and Karl Marx, Karl Marx mocked this idea in his uh, 18th Brumari of Louis Napoleon. Karl Marx begins by kind of giving a, a a sort of play on Hegel's remark that history uh, is is always happens twice. The first time is tragedy. The second time is farce. And he's referring to Napoleon the Third, comparing him to Napoleon the First. Napoleon the third being the bourgeois Napoleon mm-hmm. as a versus the aristocratic warrior Napoleon. Mm-hmm. So that here is the line of demarcation between the aristocratic age giving way 
to the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie, and the mm -hmm. bourgeoisie is a comedy. The, the bourgeois materials. are not a proper ruling class. This was really Marx's, you know, main correct insight that the bourgeoisie is not a proper ruling class. They are, you know, as uh, as other thinkers have characterized them. It was Joseph Schumpeter that said, "Look, you it, it, to have a liberal society, you have to have the steel spine of an liberal element, the aristocratic." element. This is the steel mm. spine. These are the defenders of society. You take away the defenders and what is the bourgeoisie? They just want to make money. It's like, oh yeah, we, we, we will get in bed with the Chinese. The lowest common denominator or, we'll or go, mass yeah, migration. We'll go and do this. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, oh, we'll give in to the, the proletariat. We'll give them whatever they want. We'll, you know, and so all of a sudden you have this anarchy. It was um, Jacob Burkhardt had another way of, of putting this. Jacob Burkhardt said, um, for example, there are three things that make up civilization, the church, the state, and the culture. And he said, well, if the if the church dominates, you have, you have um, theocracy. And theocracy, basically, it destroys, it tramples down the culture, and it, it basically contaminates the state, makes the state just a, a way to, uh, to enforce religion so that the, the religion itself is corrupted by performing a political function and all the other, so everything goes wrong then what happens if the state becomes preponderant, that there's no balance with the other two elements? Well, the state's function is to defend society. If the, if the state gets you know hyper strong, you have statism, and it tramples religion, tries to make the church into an instrument of state, and, and basically tramples down the economy, tramples down the culture, You know, no freedom of speech, no real innovation. But what's really interesting is what happens if culture becomes hyper-dominant over the state. And that's where we get America. See, because in America, the culture and what is culture? The culture power is money. It's the plutocracy. It is, it's democracy because in democracy is how the plutocracy rules through democracy because it buys the candidates and buys the elections. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is the problem is that, is that everything becomes about big business. Uh, you know, Burkhardt said, as in America. And, and what happens is the defensive function gets betrayed. Look at what's happening. We've abandoned our defenses. We don't have proper counterintelligence. We don't have proper intelligence. We yeah. haven't made an atomic bomb in, 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 how, in three decades. We haven't even tested one in three decades. I mean, this is like, and everything is going, and they just want to make money with China by going into business with it. This is exactly what Burkhardt meant by when the culture becomes hyper-dominant. We, we don't have a balance between the church has a spiritualizing function. The state has a defensive function. The culture has the making life livable function. And you need a balance. You can't have one of them just pushing the other two aside or trampling them down. Well, I'm going to I'm going to jump in here just really quick. You mentioned Marx before and Marx and Das Kapital, he had a good uh, insight that I thought was interesting. He said that and I never thought about it in this way that money is a social medium, right? Money is is probably the oldest social medium. So when we talk about social media, we think of Twitter, we think of Facebook, and so if you look at money, money outside of the context of society loses all meaning. If you're on a desert island, you want water, you want food, you want coconuts, mm -hmm. You know, a, a dollar bill of fiat currency is not going to really do much for you other than toilet paper. You know, it only t has value in the sense of a social kind of thing. And and so to look, I was noticing Twitter. Twitter is what we would call oh, social media, you know, social media. And Elon Musk is thinking of, you know, kind of using it as like a payment platform, like digital currencies and stuff. So it's interesting. He's doing what we think of as social media with money, which is social media. And he's kind of using both in, an, in a very interesting way. But when I was uh, getting preparing for this uh, this interview, I mean, within minutes uh, of of talking to you, I was uh, listening to this audiobook of a marketer, and he was talking about how do you get you know memes to proliferate your content? How do you get your content to proliferate? And he used a very interesting phrase. He said, um, "I'm I'm going to read my notes here." He said, um, "You know, sh memes shared at a high velocity," and I thought that was very interesting. You know, like he, like your your content has to be shareable. And so to, to, to talk about memes, let's think in terms of propaganda uh, mm -hmm. shared at a high velocity, like currency, 
right? Money yeah. is currency. Memes are currency, like ideas. And, and it gets back to this, this thing of like, what is fake news? It is a meme that is to be shared at a high velocity. And it's basically the current of the, the currency of this society. And uh, just really quickly, uh, Edward Bernays says that in Crystallizing Public Opinion um, in 1926, I believe it was, he said, we're living in a new form of government, a new one outside of the classical ones described by Aristotle, you know, like, uh, you know, monarchy, uh, aristocracy, uh, Republic, etc. Uh, he said, we're living in a new model whereby propaganda is ruling the society. And the oligarchy has never been as safe because the people are so divided. Like they weren't in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, yeah. the peasant could look, see who was ruling. Oh, the king is ruling. Look at that big castle. The guy who's in that castle is ruling. They don't know who's ruling the society. Um, they have no no idea who's in charge. Everything is is chaotic and and by design. And he said that. He said in the, in the book that the oligarchy has never been as safe as they are now because the society is so fractured, disparate, and and you can use propaganda to manipulate the society. And that that and like it gets back to what we said earlier on about all this fake news is based on the conspiracy template propaganda at a high velocity does it does it trade and and one of the things i i just wanted to get in really quickly was um that uh like why 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 does propaganda take the form or conspiracy right why does it take the form of salacious gossip and it gets back to what uh you know plato was talking about through the the voice of socrates he says that the highest level man speaks in terms of ideas that the the mid level guy speaks in terms of events and the lowest level person speaks in terms of gossip of other people he talks about other people so they form the propaganda to not be about large things or ideas systems they'll, they'll it'll be uh, uh, like 9-11 is uh, Osama bin Laden, this evil guy for no reason. There's no systems, no systems theory, no no wider trends, just this one bad guy just did evil for no reason because he's evil or Trump, uh, you know, orange man bad. You know, like they, they never discussed ideas. It was always these personal attacks, salacious attacks. It would never be about trade policy or any of the things that they were actually angry about. It was a P dossier. You know, it was always aimed at this low. Why? Because they need to target it to have, they, they want the memes to have the greatest possible velocity. And that means targeting it toward the lowest common denominator. And that's what those narratives, that's why they always take that particular form. Well, this this goes back to the fact that we are against aristocracy. We're against rule by the best people. Mm -hmm. And we are for the masses. So everything is about influencing the masses. Because if you have the masses on your side, and Mao said this, mm -hmm. Lenin said this, if you have the masses on your side, you win automatically, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that was never true in the ancient world. That was never really true because it was the, the masses would win occasionally, but Athens was the democracy and it lost. It was a failure. What ultimately won in the end was, well, the Roman mixed government, they took over everything, where they had the balance between the Senate and the people of Rome, right? With the where the where they had a veto power in the Senate and the, the popular assemblies took their votes, but they it was really a, a guided aristocratic system a Republican system that had this tremendous virtue because of the checks and balances. And, and again, it's about balance, but today there's no balance. It's all you're with the masses or you're nothing. You're, you're popular or you're nothing. Um, and, and of course this is the, the bottom down, this is the inversion of the, of, of the lowest the common denominator. The lowest man is now the model. Is now yeah. what you go to, and 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 you see Karl Marx the this inversion. Karl Marx and Das Kapital also said, you know, he he it was all his critique of economics. So he's attacking money. Money is just a medium of exchange, really, and it's an essential one for our well being. But Car Karl Marx takes it to this destructive height. So Karl Marx lampoons money in the following way. He says, well. The rich man, wealth is so distorting that the rich man, if he is weak, can be made strong. If he's ugly, his wealth makes him attractive. If he's stupid, his wealth makes him smart. You know, you know this part of dust capital, yeah. right? And so, so, but you see, and and this is true, and it and people read it and oh, that's so profound. But in reality, it's the proletariat, it's the lowest common denominator making war on the second lowest mm -hmm. you aren't getting to hey you know what we need is aristocracy what we need is a, a, a connection to the divine that mediates the whole and it's purely destructive because marx's dialectic he takes hegel who says there's an abstraction an idea 
you criticize it and you get a new idea, you get a new thing going on. And that, that ideas, you know, are determine history, determine everything. But Marx being a materialist says, no, 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 it's a concrete situation and you criticize it. And then what do you do with it? You destroy it, the revolution. And then it automatically, this great thing happens, right? <laughs> you get this dialectical magic that everything turns out good, right? But what you get is you get society totally leveled. You get these criminals in charge of everything. And it's a system of mass murder and mass destruction. And it's also a system where the truth is totally destroyed. There is no respect for truth. Mm -hmm. There is a crushing of, of everything. Well, you've murdered all the truth-based people at the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you've gotten you've, rid of all the honor-based people in the middle, the aristocracy, yes, and now yeah, it's just yeah. like the criminal you've, warlord. You've, you've you've lined up all the priests and mm. the religious people and the holy people and the really sincere people, the people who have this this commitment to truth. You've eliminated them first. Then you've gone after the aristocrats to wipe out anyone who who has honor. And so, what are you left with? You're left with the scum of the earth in charge of everything. Like, well, what what else is Stalin? Who else is Lenin? They are they are criminals. They are misfits. I remember um, one former disgruntled KGB guy said that um, he, he used to talk to the librarian in the in the classified library in Moscow that holds six thousand Lenin documents in secret. And it's like, what's in this thing? It's Lenin. A lot of these are letters from Lenin using profanity, saying kill the children, murder them all, make a provocation, destroy the village, you know? Mm -hmm. He's a he's a homicidal maniac. And I had the former GRU defector, Stanislav Lunev, had been inside that library. And he told me the same thing. He said, I lost my faith in communism when I read Lenin's, you know, I actually looked, he looked at Lenin's letters mm -hmm. and he was shocked. His hero was this maniac, Psychopath. right? Yeah, Bertrand Russell did the same thing. He met Lenin and he thought he'd be this profound Napoleonic figure and he was just a guy who read one book and he was just like shocked at how his, his mental compass was so narrow. He was, he was yeah. such like a, like a, an but there's an advantage. Man. Lenin was partly deaf. There's an advantage to blocking out everything else and yeah. just hearing your own fanatical, crazy, mad ideas, you know, that are echo and, and you get such an intensity and such a focus and it's, and, and people think, Oh, Lenin was a good guy. You know, Stalin distorted it. No, Solzhenitsyn is very yeah. clear on this. Lenin was a murdering. It killed about eleven million people before. Son of a gun. gun, yeah. And 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 he just didn't live long enough yeah. to to do the things. And and Stalin really was carrying out Lenin's program in all respects. He really was a Leninist. Um, and and really, he was the guy that really Lenin could see in Stalin. The guy that could carry it out. And there's even these letters between Lenin and Trotsky. Mm -hmm. And Trotsky hated Stalin. And Trotsky yeah. admitted, well, they had this up uprising in Tambov during the Civil War where the people just, they went berserk against the communists. And they said, we got to wipe these, these farmers out. We got to destroy them. And well, who can we send? You know, who can we send with Felix Jerzinski, with Iron Jerzinski, who could actually have the nerve to do it? What commissar could we send? And I, there's only Stalin. And it's Trotsky. I hate to say that, you know, I don't get along with him, but Stalin has to be the guy because only Stalin's willing to do the He's brutal. The thing, right? He's the guy. He's the only bloodthirsty guy we've got who will actually do this. And Lenin said, yeah, you're right. It's got to be uh, Koba or, uh, you know, which was, was his revolutionary name before he was Stalin. But, um, you know, so uh, we don't we don't quite understand. And this this goes back to Parmenides saying that the divine beyond is the eternal now but so is the so is the demonic uh, beyond is the eternal now it's 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 it is there is a kind of evil which turns everything upside down on its head you could say that there is an order in the universe a natural order a given order by the ultimate being god and here P parmenides denies that things have being the the, the great mind beyond the divine eternal now is the only real being for parmenides mm. and so he's saying and this is where the stoics get it right is is the idea that um 
there is the only thing that is real is the thing that's eternal. You know, the thingness of reality is an illusion. It is those deeper qualities, those inward qualities that are decisive. And, and that means good and evil, right? Is decisive. That the order within, the order that comes from the ultimate mind and the inversion of that ultimate mind, the attack on that ultimate mind. And so um, so you have, you know, this is where Eric Vergelin comes off saying that the ultimate anti-movement is Gnosticism, which says that God is the devil, right? The mm. creator God is a demiurgos. Demiurge, and it's yeah. funny that um, the basics of Leninism by Stalin, he starts out talking about the de demiurgo, right? Mm. The demiurgos, the demiurge. And, and uh, that's a very funny thing. And in fact, I saw a recent lecture on Islam say, you know, that Islam is a Gnostic, is officially it's Gnostic, because they believe the creator God, Yahweh, of the Old Testament is really Satan mm -hmm. in Islamic theology. Isn't that interesting? And of course, this was a thing, and, and of course, people get mad at, at um, Eric Verglund for saying, oh, he says everything is Gnostic. You know, the Nazis are Gnostic, the communists are Gnostic, they're all Gnostic movements. But um, he says, look, um, I would be the greatest scholar in the world if I made this discovery, but I'm pointing at these experts going back more than 100 years who made all these discoveries about the role that Gnostic ideas have played mm -hmm. in creating this, these negative movements. And in fact, Carl Jung in his book, Aeon, really also kind of, he called it an antichrist movement in history. And he defined antichrist, he said, he said, Christ promised the millennium where the lion lies down with the lamb, mm -hmm. or I guess it's supposed to be the wolf lies down with the lamb. Yeah, God. <laughs> right. Now. But but it's uh but as I remember it, it's a lion lies down with the lamb. And so uh but but the Antichrist promises that same thing, but he delivers the exact opposite. And this is Marxism, this is Nazism, national socialism, this is Islam. Right. Well, it's, the, it's the material, the promise of the material rather than the promise of the spiritual, like in, in our. Yes, uh, it's system. an inversion. Yes. Yeah, we, we um, had spiritual values, yeah. free speech, but, things that it, were intangible. It, uh, now, Marxism promises commodities, physical. Well, things. I ironically, of course, what's ironic is, is that both are an attempt. It's just a materialist attempt to escape from reality. Um, and this is what Gnosticism is. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Albigensian heresy, which. You know, this is where the Inquisition started, was fighting them. They believed that since this world was made by the devil or by an evil spirit, and we were imprisoned, our souls were imprisoned in this evil world, the thing to do was commit mass suicide and escape. Just perfect yourself, make yourself worthy, and get out. Get the heck out of this world. So what it is, is it's, it's world denying. In a way that Marxism is, there's a kind of, Inverted Puritanism in in the Marxist. In the I call them impuritans. People. Yeah, impuritans they are, but it's because a, they it's always a, promote vice. You know, it's like vice. Yeah, it is. It, it's perversion. it's amazing. It's an inverted Puritanism. Yeah, but they they had this too, and it's what's interesting is is that they they are so again. You think about how marvelous the universe is, how marvelous this order is, and and I always point to the Book of Job in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Job, everything goes wrong for Job. And his friends say, you know, he, he loses everything. He's covered in boils. He's suffering. And people tell him, just curse God and die. You know, God did you wrong. Uh, why are you faithful to him? Why do you hold out, out your, why do you have faith in him? And Job just won't let go of that faith that God is good. The universe is ultimately benevolent that any hardship we go through, our mission is to just endure. And that is the, the Gnostics say, no, it's a bad, you know, let's, this game is no fun. Let's overturn the table. Let's reject God in the universe. There's nothing to be learned from this. There's nothing positive in it. It's all evil. Let's let's get out. Let's destroy it. Let's break it down. Let's annihilate it. Let's criticize it, as Marx says. Criticize it and have the revolution and overthrow God, overthrow the universe, reject reality. Whatever that, is, you know, Parmenides says the ultimate reality is the eternal now, the, the, the divine internal now. So reject that. But but Job is clinging to it. And of course, his faith is rewarded in the end. 
And God doesn't explain in, in the book. He refuses to, where were you when I formed the foundations of the, of the world? You will never understand me, but you are rewarded for your faith because God is ultimately benevolent. This is the, this is the, and of course it's Soren Kierkegaard uh, in his, um, in his book on despair, he calls it the sin of despair, right? Um, and and the sin of despair is despair is the opposite of faith. So the spin of sin of despair has all these aspects. He goes through all of the different aspects in the book, and it's this is what is at the root of Gnosticism. It's a negativity. It is a despair. Oh, I'm not God in this universe, so I don't want to play. Herbert Marcuse called uh, critical race theory the power of negative thinking instead of the yes. power of positive thinking. And oh that's yeah, exactly well what you know. Is. When I was in graduate school, the the thing on the lips of my Marxist colleagues was the negation of the negation. Yeah, you know, negation is the revolution. You have reality; they're going to negate reality itself, which is capitalism. You know, uh, well, the the system, the man, whatever. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to jump in and, and contradict you for just a little bit in that because mm-hmm. I was about to come to this point, which is. We were talking about like we don't have the checks and balances anymore. We don't have the the aristocracy, right? And so we were supposed to have this balance that count, kind of counter, you know, balanced, uh, you know, our our worst, most uh, kind of you know consumer impulses, our materialist impulses that made us little more than animals. And uh, we have no aspirational figures. We have no heroes anymore. They've destroyed them. They're all we have celebrities, and though. slave owners and bad. <laughs> and yeah. And so but one of the I, I'm going to be talking later in the week with um, Jordan Nyland, and he's a professor. And this gets back to what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, like the, th- the, the, the three tiered thing of society and, and our checks and balances. And and you you mentioned the 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 king, you know, the, the, the religious kind of king figures, you know, pharaohs and, and sorrow on you know Sumerian and everything um and uh so he, he, in in law the earliest form of law was basically universal law cosmic law how, how the cosmos works we're going to take those same principles and apply them to the earth for instance the Indians have karma so so if you believe in karma as a cosmic law you're likely to make an eye for an eye tooth for a tooth homeostasis you're, you're going to want balance right um so you're going to translate so that's the the earliest form of law was cosmic law the second vo- ver- version of law was was essentially uh, social order, right? Maintaining social order, maintaining caste systems. Uh, in our society, it would have been Jim Crow, that kind of stuff. Um, the third, and this is the last. The last version of law was was uh, prop- protection of property and uh, enforcement of contracts. That was the the last and the latest, right? So we basically. When we started as a society, we started as cosmic law. All men are created equal, you know, by their creator. We are endowed with certain inalienable rights by our creator. That was cosmic law, right? Yeah. Got rid of that. Then, then we have that social order law. Oh well, we got to get rid of social order law. We can't have vice squads. Vice is good, you know. Go to the pride parade, whatever. Get rid of that. So now, now we come to the third version of, of law, the, the the most shallow version, which is protection of property. We're not even doing that now. Oh, you want to? Well, that, go that's rob what a CVS? Richard Weaver not... said. Yeah, we, Richard Weaver said it was the last thing we had left was property rights. And it's and it's going because of these critical. But I wanted wanted to why why I circled back to that is. Uh, What's his name? Uh, he was a sociologist, Talcott Parsons, in the in the thirties and forties. He wrote um, social action theory, and he he basically talks about how capitalism is corrosive to traditionalism because capitalism is always striving after new ways to do things. Innovation, so it always, yeah. it's always going toward novelty, toward the new. And so we were sold this bill of goods. There was the the original America First movement back in the thirties with Charles Lindbergh and stuff, mm-hmm. and uh, Father Coughlin. That terrified the powers that be. They almost kept us out of World War Two. Have to discredit that. Take that down. So they replaced the original concept of Americanism with this new concept. Oh, we're not going to do Americanism or patria, the country. No, that's too, you know, that that that's racist. We're going to break capitalism. And so you have the second fake version of conservatism that, um, that gets rid of Americanism and now capitalism. But and then they'll tell you, oh, well, we'll do capitalism and I'm conservative and traditional. No, capitalism erodes traditionalism. So this false, this fake version of a counterfeit conservatism that that pushes toward us. It's the economy, stupid. You don't want to live in a home. We want a Walmart. Our country is just a Walmart. This is an economic zone. Everything is economics. Those are the fake conservatives. Those are the ones who were the, the first ones to get rid of that. those top two 
tiers of the society. They get yeah. rid of the of the god of God of cosmic law. They get rid of the aristocracy in the middle, the honor based people, and now it's just ruled by by you know the the bourgeoisie or whatever by money, the corporate class. Yeah, money. Yeah. And and so yeah, and then society. And the, and the next phase is the mob. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, the point one point I would make is that conspiracy theory is just Marxism for stupid people. In the sense that um, the stupid people feel envy for the people that have money, and they then, uh, since everything's going awry, it must be a conspiracy. The money people are doing it to us on purpose, when really it's the madness of clockwork. It's just how that they're in. Inf- Imagine you have an inferior type of human, a limited type of human, the the money people, which they would just be outraged for me to say that the 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 masters of the universe on Wall Street are inferior I mean, types. But they are. If you read Plato, if you read Census Aristotle, they're not going to yeah. say these people are, you know, it's it's but they but but so you can criticize this, which Marx is doing. But the conspiracy theory is a more visceral aimed at the lowest of the low saying these people are trying to screw you up. These people are robbing from you. Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, because the the proletarian revolution theory failed, because actually the capitalists are good at making everybody more prosperous. The problem is, by making all these people more prosperous, they have undone them, because they've made a shopping mall regime, a shopping mall regime in which people get weaker and weaker as they get more and more pampered, and they are delivered they are delivered into the they're tenderized for destruction because they, <laughs> they it's it's the um, it, it, it's the fat farm paradox. The wealthier they get, the skinnier they get because they go out and exercise. But the the poor people get fatter, right? We've got people on welfare who are just enormous blimps. I just found right? out from uh, Principia Ethica. I just finished the audio book recording that. And uh, G.E. Moore back in 1903, he, he kind of introduced me to the term. Um, there's evolution, which, you know, at the time they were, th- oh, better and better progress. And then there's involution. Involution is when you get slower, dumber, fatter. And so natural selection would be a process by which people got smarter, faster. You had to to survive. The dumb died. Uh, Whereas we're on a farm where you're basically, we're seeing involution. We're seeing people getting dumber and slower and fatter, like you said, uh, tenderized for destruction. (laughs) They're becoming more neurotic. Yeah. I mean, they're more neurotic. They're getting crazier. I mean, Mm. um, what was it? Nardo wrote. Nordau wrote the book on degeneration, which one of my readers mentioned to me. So I've been reading it. And of course, I'm not a materialist. I'm not a physicalist. But it's very interesting to to meditate on this idea of degeneration, because I believe degeneration, it it begins in the soul. But yet, it is possible through an orientation to comfort, an orientation to hedonism, to weaken the, 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 the will, to weaken the muscles of virtue, within the person, the, the strength, the inner strength can be unwound. Um, Nietzsche wrote about um, the unstringing of man's bow, b- bow, so that there's no tension in man. To He can no longer shoot an arrow. At, at, he can no longer accomplish anything inwardly because there's no tension in him. Yeah. And and so we, it's all lax. It's all in, about enjoyment. And the thing is, is that that the is the purpose of life to become, uh, you know, job of the hut, to become you know five hundred pounds and and have every one of your senses tickled. Well, um, I don't Pyth- think so. Pythagoras said that he said, "Don't listen to music uh, for entertainment. Listen to music to purify the soul." Right. No. So, are we a society that aims at the soul, at the top tier of that pyramid, or is it? Are we going to be entertained to death? You know, where we're, we're just yeah. doing the lower things. I wanted to, to just. I'm going to close uh, here, but I wanted to um, mention one thing. I noticed that the difference between conspiracy fact and conspiracy theory, and this is just me noticing this, is that. Um, just as gossip, the lower love, lowest lowest level of person concentrates on gossip, on personality. Uh, Herbert Spencer says in 1873 in the study of sociology, he says that you can almost gauge somebody's intelligence level by their ability to generalize because generalization is pattern recognition. Do you see patterns? And the higher level people see patterns 
hence ideas. They, 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 they operate on the level of ideas. The lowest level people operate on gossip, on just personalities. So, so most bad conspiracy theories are personality based, orange man, bad, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and the highest level things that are more likely to be true, that are actual conspiracies that do happen are systems based conspiracies. Like for, for instance, with the rich, um, you know, doing certain things, there's certain systemic things that will happen over and over again, not based on personalities, but just based, if you create a particular system, you will get a similar reaction because systems are based on repetition. Don Alameda says that she says that if it does not repeat, it is not a system. So history does not repeat itself systems repeat themselves, institutions. So if you have similar institutions, you're going to see repetitions of similar behavior, which is why you see similarities between the America and Rome or the Spanish empire and America, the British empire, you, you, because similar institutions will lead to similar behavioral patterns. So if you're looking at you know things that are going bad in your life, it is most likely that there is a system in place. And we're really bad at that. Like I, I would consider myself more on the right. And as somebody more on the right, I notice that a lot of people on the right, one of the downfalls of the right is they tend not to do system systems thinking, right? They'll, they'll, they'll attack like an individual Hitler and they'll never look at the, the system that created a Hitler. Uh, or, or for instance, the, the left will talk, oh, systemic racism. They're always talking about systems. The left will quietly change systems, institute new systems, uh, you know, uh, uh, through civil rights acts and stuff. They will actually do this kind of stuff. The right doesn't. The right just, oh, Trump will save us. We'll send a single individual. And Donella Meadows warns about that in Thinking in Systems. She says, don't think that you will send a single politician to Washington and it'll change everything. If She said, this is not about personalities. It's about systems. If you do not change the system, you will change nothing. So this policy policy prescription to the right. Hey, we'll send this one guy and we won't change any of the systems. <laughs> Meanwhile, the left is quietly changing all the systems. You know, that that to me is very very dangerous. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well let's let's leave it there and I want to thank J.R. Nyquist. Uh he was the uh counsel for the uh prosecution and I was the counsel for the defense on uh, conspiracy theories and I want to thank him for his great insights and uh, I will catch you next time and uh, come back anytime. Uh, J.R. Nyquist. J.R. Nyquist.blog. Visit my site. <laughs> there you go. I, I forgot. J.R. N-Y-Q-U-I-S-T.blog. <laughs> there you little, go. Yeah. There's a little self-serving advertisement. I'd like to take a moment to thank you for watching. If you'd like to stay updated, hit the like and subscribe buttons. But more importantly, if you don't want to see me reduced to shelling my old merch, such as the Daniel Natal and action figure, where you can see Daniel engaging in an action as he watches TV or engaging in an action as he surfs the internet or failed products like the Daniel Natal Pez dispenser or the even more considered Daniel Natal urinal cake. Think about supporting the show by buying one of my books. For instance, you can buy my book, Actionable Ethics. The link is in the description below.